I want people to know that we're not pretending to be a bigger company. Mm -hmm. I think that's always one of the biggest pitfalls that an indie studio can fall into is starting to try to fall into PR speak when mm -hmm. you're just a bunch of dudes in a bedroom, you know? <laughs> right. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris are joined by Eric Brody of Poly Knight Games to discuss community management and marketing in the indie game industry. Plus, impressions of PlayStation VR, Sukaden 2, and more. BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 94 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, everybody. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, hey. And once again, we have Eric Brody with us. Hello. You're still here? Yeah, it's been a while. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> a whole week. Uh, anyway. <laughs> You've been camping Yeah, I've, out, just, I've right? just been sitting here at this table waiting for this. <laughs> yeah. Why are yeah. you in our recording studio? <laughs> 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 um, but today our media topic of discussion is going to be uh, very Eric-centric. Um, because Eric -centric? Uh, yeah, he, he joined us last time to talk about Final Fantasy XV, but today we're going to be talking a bit about um, the indie game business. Uh, Eric is a community manager for Poly Night Games, a local Dallas indie game studio, and uh, has a lot of experience uh, with... Uh, promoting that product on Twitter and other social media, and so it's going to be interesting to get his perspectives on that. A little bit of a industry insider sort of episode this time. Uh, but before we do that, we have our usual opening segments, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. So the uh, the new toy that came in this week is uh, the PlayStation VR. I uh, I'd, I'd been playing around with the Vive that we have at our office long enough that I was thinking, you know what, I like VR enough um, that I want to go ahead and take the plunge and get into it. Wow, so um, you. You've experienced the vibe too. Have you played with the Oculus, Oculus as well? Very briefly. Okay. I, play, I played a little bit at, uh, at Playful Corp. So, for those that, that may not know the difference and haven't gone back and listened to our episode about VR um, with Phil Johnson, mm -hmm. um, I encourage you to do that. Yeah, but for sure. those that haven't, do you want to explain the difference between something like the Oculus mm -hmm. VR, the PSVR versus the Vive? Mm -hmm. So, actually, the Oculus and the PlayStation, from what I understand, are fairly similar now mm -hmm. as far as what they're capable of. Um, but basically those are going to be more or less in either a static standing or a static sitting position and it'll be able to track your head movements as far as like looking up, down, left, right, you know, you can sort of like lean left and right and we'll still track you that way. Um, you can lean forward and back. And they also have um, motion control options. So, for example, uh, with the PlayStation, you can get the PlayStation Move, and you can use those. Mm -hmm. um, the Oculus has some you know, custom-made uh, motion controls. The Vive is actually the most different from those two because it's... Um, room scale. Ro room scale yeah. VR, room space VR. And so they set up um, sensors in opposite corners of kind of your square play, play area. And you can actually walk around in this space. It's actually very immersive. It's really cool. And I actually think that for people trying out um, VR for the first time, I'd recommend going with Five because they design all those games very specifically to take advantage of that room scale well, VR. If you have the space, mm -hmm. though, yes, that's the and that, you that's have to have space for it. And you also need to have a very powerful processor. Yes. <laughs> um, which is why I decided to go with the PlayStation because one, the headset is the cheapest out of all of them, mm -hmm. and two, I have the hardware. I know the yeah. games that I get for it. Are You've got the PS4, so exactly. Yeah. With the with the PSVR, mm -hmm. what games have you tried so far? Um, so they, it came with a demo disc, which is actually pretty cool. You get a few different experiences. And the ones that um, I thought were of most interest to me personally mm. were um, Rigs, which is a kind of like, um, it's almost like sports and a mech, but you're also shooting each other. Oh, I thought it was like uh, you're driving like truck. No, a trucker. Big, big rig. <laughs> like big rigs. <laughs> that, that could be cool, actually. It could be cool. Um, and you could e adjust your trucker cap as you're driving. <laughs> and oh, uh, E-Valkyrie, which is actually one of the reasons, like between... Um, uh, Phil telling us about Lucky's Tale and Eve Valkyrie. Mm -hmm. Those were like the two that I most wanted to play. Wait, is that is that related to Eve Online it or is. Gun Valkyrie? Eve Online. Okay. Um, and no one's gonna get that Gun Valkyrie <laughs> reference. It's a. It's at its core, it's a multiplayer mm -hmm. space dogfighting 
game simulation. Oh. Um, and it's very, very cool. And now something I'll note just real quick, like the difference between PSVR and, say, the Vive. And this is not a surprising difference, but because the hardware is not as powerful on the PlayStation 4, um, I think it runs in, like, 720, maybe in some cases 480, um, because it's, like, mirroring, you know, both eyes. Um, you can definitely tell that graphically, you know, they're keeping the textures low res. The models are generally lower mm-hmm. poly count. Um, but it doesn't look bad. Um, you get into it, and, like, if it sort of is a little bit off-putting at first, um, you start ignoring it pretty quickly. I mean, I, my only my, – my experience in terms of owner, I've actually tried all of them. But my the only one that I actually own is the Gear VR just because I haven't really wanted to mm-hmm. plunk the money down. For sure. And uh, that one is the lowest of the fidelity of them. Mm-hmm. And you still – you get used to it. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, I can see what you're saying in terms of the difference, like the Vive. Mm-hmm. is very pretty far and away kind of like you know blows it all out even the oculus though when you play it on a high-end system mm-hmm. um looks really nice it's like all pc gaming if you have yeah. the hardware for it you can run it really well mm-hmm. um i think that the point there um as well that has kind of got me excited about playstation vr mm-hmm. is the very fact that as like kind of traditionally more of a console gamer versus pc is mm-hmm. i respect that yeah there's probably a better experience out there but as long as my experience is good enough right um and the PSVR is the only one that I've ever actually gotten a chance to play. Mm-hmm. I've actually never used an Oculus or uh, or a Vive, um, but and so like I was actually I I liked it better than I actually thought that I was, mm-hmm. especially like with motion sickness issues. It's yeah. actually uh, the only game that I ever played with uh, that I ever played was Res. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like on a demo room floor, and I was just fine with it actually, surprisingly. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of my I friends, played a little bit of Res too. Yeah, it was it was done really well. It, mm-hmm. it, who would have thought that like 15 years ago when we were playing that game that that would work in VR? You know? <laughs> um, but one of my friends who had otherwise played on both the other ones and actually like worked on both of the other ones and had never experienced the PlayStation VR, that was his first time, mm-hmm. was actually shocked at how much he liked it. Mm-hmm. Um, for the cost that they were actually doing it for, still how good it was compared mm-hmm. to the other ones. I guess mm-hmm. I want to get y'all's thoughts on that as well, if you kind of felt that for its cost and like for what it is... Mm-hmm. It's still I, I, solid? Oh, yeah, I think so. Um, it's it's definitely the best entry point into VR, I think, for because of the price. If you already have a PlayStation, I wouldn't say necessarily... I mean, it really just depends on how much you're willing to spend. But, but I think it's... Do you need to get the... Do you need to buy the Move? Uh, uh, the, move, move the Move is optional. Too? You do need the PlayStation camera, though, and that's sold separately. Mm-hmm. Okay, so see, there's a little bit um, more yeah. of a, so a, it's, a cost it's, of entry. It's not 400 It's 400 for the headset, 50 for the camera. So altogether, it's $450 investment plus your PS4. Okay. Um, but when you compare that to say the Vive being like eight hundred, yeah, plus you know two thousand dollar computer, that makes sense, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean for for me. Uh, for me, my answer would be no, having experienced them. That's which is why I don't own them. Mm-hmm. Um, which is why the only one I bought was the Gear, just because I think it was like 100 or 150 And so briefly to sort of comment on E-Valkyrie, which is the one game made for VR that I own currently. Um, full game. Um, really cool um, space flight simulator. Um, it, it, you're doing these dog fights, and everything is very chaotic. There's kind of like the hairball that forms in the middle of the map when everyone's trying to shoot each other. Um, and just like the when you put on your headphones and you got this like 3D sound going on, you can hear shots like going like you know to your left and to your right or like across the bow kind of. Um, and being able to like when you're chasing someone, actually look up and see them as you're chasing them. Oh, that's neat. Um, rather than relying only on the arrows to see where they are is super cool. Um, so that's it's definitely like um, I think one of the reviewers and like this is something that you'll see if you play the demo. There's like maybe a two minute experience before they cut you off in the demo that came on the disc uh, for PlayStation VR um, but like they as the as the ship is booting up which is a really cool experience too like the um, the launch tube is like lighting up and like all your systems are turning on and it's doing like you know checks and stuff like that so you're looking around the cockpit um, which is like a really neat looking cockpit in and of itself but you know one of the quotes that came up was uh you know, sort of fulfills the fantasy of, you know, being an ace space fighter. And you definitely get that feeling because, like, you launch out this tube kind of Gundam style. Um, and, you know, that's that's always a rush. And then you're flying around in this space battle and you can, you know, look left and look right and get, like, you know, pilots always talk about keeping your head on a swivel. Mm. You can do that in this game um, without it being, like, this awkward thing where you, like, move the right stick to, like, you know, that's it, yeah. it, never worked before. We'll have to check back in with you later to see other games that you've played. and, and For sure. If your thoughts have changed, or if you found one that you think really works well, well, you guys still cool. need to come over and play uh, Batman uh, Crowdplay. So uh, maybe, I, oh yes, we, we need to you do can that. Check out yes. VR too. Yeah. So. yeah. Let's all go on a nostalgia trip to see what we can learn from games of the past. Recently, I've been. Uh, 
playing around with my uh, Retro Pi, which is kind of a, a Raspberry Pi emulator system that you can play multiple old games. Mm -hmm. um, I never actually had a PlayStation 1 growing up, so my experience playing those games has been solely through emulation. And um, I've played and been a fan of this, the, the, the Suikoden or Suikoden series, I don't know how to exactly to pronounce that, uh, from Konami. Um, for a while, but um, I hadn't actually. I've only actually played three, four, and five. I haven't played the first two. I'd always heard good things about the second game, so I, I actually have gone back and started to play it. I've put in about uh, twenty-five or so hours, so I feel I've I've gotten a pretty deep experience already. I'm I'm pr only probably about halfway through the game. Um, for those that are unfamiliar, have you played? Uh, Suikoden before? I actually haven't. It's on my short list of games that like I must play. Mm. <laughs> so the interesting thing about it, and um, is the way that the story is kind of is kind of told. It, at first, it feels like um, it is it is a it is a two D game. By the way, two, it feels very much um, like a Super Nintendo type of uh, RPG. So it's taking it's not going in the three D route like some of the PlayStation games did, like Final Fantasy series on PlayStation. So um, it does look really good if you're a fan of sprite uh, graphics, which I am, or well-done sprite graphics. Um, but uh, it, it initially feels very shallow, but uh, quickly, as the game opens up, it actually has um, a pretty mature storyline, just about uh, warfare and um, gray characters. I think it's like, that's its biggest uh, selling point, is that the, so many characters in the cast are um, not really like all all good or all evil. There are shades of gray, and the ma even the main uh, villain of of this game, uh, Luca Blight, who kind of has become notorious as one of the more well known, um, at least in JRPG circles, uh, villains. But even though he initially comes across as kind of a um, a psycho, like over the top evil character, almost like Kefka from mm -hmm. Final Fantasy VI, he actually like his motivations start making more and more sense as you go deeper into the game. So it's really interesting how they handle it, where um, some of his reasonings for, you know, raising villages, for example, um, has a lot to do with the way that he wants to be perceived by his soldiers, or has to do with his, and I'm trying not to swell too much, um, or the strategies that he has for, um, you know, his plans to kind of colonize the rest of the world, I guess you can say. And this is not to say that, that his motivations are justified in what he's doing, but it's, it takes this view of not, this person, bad, go kill person, and more of a, okay, this, he has a very different viewpoint. Obviously, it is not, it is not a um, morally justified viewpoint, but he's not a um, cartoonish villain. He's, mm -hmm. a, he's a real person that has a real motivation that you can, you can actually kind of see where he's coming from. Um, when they start to delve a little bit more into his past and that kind of thing, which I thought was in an interesting way to go with it. The other thing is that this game is very big on character betrayal and characters entering and leaving your party regularly. Mm. So it's very much... A, this game, uh, the Suikoden series is kind of um, infamous for the, its number of characters. Each game has 108 characters. Wow. Not all that you have to collect, you have to find them. I've noticed a lot of people have strategies, from what I had looked online, just out of curiosity, for bringing, this is the best character... But I found myself actually wanting to experiment with different um, combinations mm -hmm. because the game rewards you in the way the, those characters interact. There's different dialogue scenes that you can trigger by having those characters together. And sometimes it's because the characters have a unique relationship. Like there's um, a one pair of one pair is actually um, a married couple, like an older married couple. And so they have a very interesting way of... Um, a, a unique way, I should say, of looking at situations and viewing and viewing things that that two other characters that may not have the same relationship, you're not going to get that same sort of a scene. Um, you can actually only take six characters in your party at one time, though. So it kind of, which is more than a traditional RPG. Yeah. But um, it's it's when you consider that you have 108 characters uh, of about 60 or so of those are playable. That's not as many as you would think. So you really right. have to kind of plan out, and they all will level kind of at their own pace. So you kind of have it, it's very. I would say it's not as grindy as I expected, but uh, you definitely have to be a little careful because the game also is pretty challenging for what it is. Um, just to touch on the combat system just real quick, it does something interesting, and, and with uh, it is a turn-based game, but it does something interesting with its style of combat is that characters have three different ranges, uh, short range, medium range, and long range. So within those, but you, but you only have um, two rows of attack. 
in, in the game when you, you basically choose your formation. So, um, and magic can be cast from any row. Um, so if you're, if you're a medium character, you can be in the front row or you can be in the back row. You can attack from both rows. So it's great if you're, you know, medium characters kind of have that versatility. If you're a short range character, you have to be in the front row. You can't attack. So they do an interesting thing where there's, there's, a, there's a, a magic user in the game. It's a very powerful magic user, but he has short range. Hmm. So you have to put him in the back row because you can cast magic from any row, yeah. but you can quickly run out of magic. So it's like you kind of have to be very strategic if you want to bring them along. Um, Long-range characters are the reverse of the short range. They can only attack from the back row. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there's this element of, and and by the way, enemies do have the same sort of restrictions. So if you want to attack someone in the back row, you can't do it until you, unless you have a ranged attack, you can't attack them until you you kill whoever's in front of them. So there's kind of this strategic element of, do I want to try to use... Um, an AOE attack to hit everyone. Different different attacks have um, different properties, like it attacks everyone in one row or one column. Um, so it, it, it kind of has this weird mix. It also mixes in uh, turn-based strategy, like warfare turn-based strategy, into the game as well hmm. in, in, a, in a very strange way. That, I would say, is my least favorite part of the game because it is very luck-based because you're only in control of a couple of units and then the rest of the units in your army you're not in control of. And if they die in that battle, they die forever. So you have to be very careful about um, you know, saving right before these big battles. Because if they die, you probably don't want them to be dead for good. Right. Yeah. This is a game that, um, especially like in the RPG community, is often cited as like one of the better or like more important games in JRPG yeah. history. Um, from what you've experienced so far, is that hyperbole or is that actually... Um, pretty close. I've been really enjoying it, so I would say it's. It, I wouldn't. St- I still wouldn't put it up there with with my top dogs. Mm-hmm. But I'm not through the game yet, so that's a little yeah. bit. That's a little bit harsh to say. Um, I, it also wasn't my first um, Sukhoi experience. My first one was actually three. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really ended up enjoying three a lot. So some of the things that they did with team attacks, which they do have unite attacks in this one too, where the characters can team up and and do like a super ability. And you use both their turns. I think they handled that element of the game better in three. So I felt I keep feel I as I'm playing it. I you feel like the later ones. Yeah, I feel like, like it needs. And it's weird. Four and five, I actually thought were not as good in terms of the way they did the unites. Mm-hmm. But um, but I still think that this one, at least the story story wise, it's better. There are some very interesting characters, and it's definitely worth playing if you're interested in this style this style of game. Cool. So um, yeah. Believe it or not, we're not always playing games. Every now and then, we like to talk about the other stuff. There's a culture out there among anime fans um, that understands that uh, dubs are terrible, um, that being English translations of Japanese shows where people do voices in English, um, and that the only way to watch anime properly is to have subtitles. Um, that was the truth back in the 90s. Come on, I'm not going to say. I, I personally don't it's agree so with much that. Better now. Okay, so actually, we are like uh, three anime fans yes. who actually agree that dubs are not just like the bane of right. the cool. It depends on the dub, right? Absolutely. Like, so yeah, like, like, they're, they're good on, dubs, yeah. they're bad dubs. Come you know? on. Yeah, exactly. Um, but <laughs> there was an anime that came out a while back called Ghost Stories. Um, and it was so bad that it basically put its studio out of business. Uh, oh wow! And, but yeah. uh, lo- local local uh, localization studio Funimation uh, out of the DFW area uh, acquired the rights to this show. And now I forget exactly the details, but my understanding mm. is that compared to most um, times when you get to license a show for translation, um, the requirements that they set forth for this show were very very loose. It, it, has uh, it Funimation was... gotten better, by the way, in terms of dubbing? Because I still kind of avoid them like the play. Uh, well, not. Funimation actually doesn't dub themselves. Okay. Um, they actually only license and then they work with. But because of course being here in the Dallas area and there's a lot of voiceover I, studios yeah. here they work with a lot of the same teams but I, I just was so disgusted by their dub of One Piece that I just kind of well that was four kids <laughs> oh you're yeah. right actually the that one, was the one Piece, that wasn't Funimation yeah the Funimation one is much you're more right more. okay huh okay interesting very brief premise of the show you have a bunch of kids who are like I guess middle schoolers um, who yeah. basically have run-ins with ghosts um, it, it's almost like a Japanese goosebumps in a way um, except it's ongoing it's the same characters and one of the characters her mom was a monster hunter or a ghost hunter and so she has a diary that they refer to to figure out how it is they need to deal with these ghosts um, 
it's bad. It's not a good show. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they basically had a, like some very loose requirements for like you know you have to keep all the characters the same and all the monsters have to die in the same way. But otherwise, carte blanche to do whatever you want. So they were actually told the way that they actually got this license mm-hmm. was um, they were actually told to do that. To it do wasn't that. even like say like a Shin Chan example where mm-hmm. they just said there's too many um, like kind of pop culture references yes. from 80s Japan that just we can't right. use so, so just rewrite it. Different and they got references. the rights to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. No, in this situation, they that, did an too. excellent Shin job Chan with is, it. Is yeah, fantastic. it's wonderful. Yeah. Um, in this situation, actually the um, Japanese holding company that actually owns the rights over there specifically told them you can't follow the story because this is actually such, like they didn't want essentially word to spread of how bad this was <laughs> the story and so they bad. said well don't worry we'll rewrite it right. and then that's how they actually got the and, and so what we got is wow. um Wow. The, my, the way my brother likes to put it is it's the most DFW anime there is. <laughs> um, That's a wow. great way to put it. Yes. <laughs> because um, there's... So, like, there's this one character, like, the little boy who, like, you know, is always kind of, like, you know, complaining and whining. They'll just, like, literally have him be like... Blah, 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 blah. Like, just, like, you can't understand what he's saying. Um, there's this one character who's, like, this evangelical Christian. And as a Christian, I can say this. It's the annoying type. <laughs> oh, it's, yeah. It's the ones that just, like, are constantly beating you over the head with how you're a sinner and how, like, they're quoting scripture all the time in places that don't make sense. Um, so that's, you know, a really funny character. And I think that comes out of the DFW where the buckle of the Bible belt. So that's definitely a culture that um, people can make fun of around here. Given that I'm actively seeking a biblical degree right now, I'm going to refrain from commenting. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, it's got a lot of racier jokes. It makes a lot of uh, pop culture references, especially for the time. Um, you know, it's they, they've kind of taken these kids. They're supposed to be in like in the original. I'm sure we're like you know, there's just these innocent, you know, happy go lucky kids. Um, they turned them, got them into a holes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the results are hilarious. Like yeah. it's just it's mm. it's bad. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of those shows that um, people actually like the American the English dub much better because it took a show that was bad and made it at least ironically bad. You know, made it funny. Mm. Um, and they actually re aired it in Japan at one point um, with the English dub and Japanese subs. Oh god. Oh, interesting. That, that's that is a, really interesting. That, that, that's, it was a, a very okay. interesting phenomenon in that regard. That's kind of a neat way to do it, actually. Do, do, do you have any idea how it was received in Japan? Uh, I, I think better. I don't know if it was great, but you know, people probably appreciate it for what it was, if I had to guess. I'm just curious, because I know that um, they did something similar with the American Power Rangers. They actually aired it with um, you know subtitles in Japan, and it actually had a different... Um, like. A different set of you know, following from the other Super Sentai series. It yeah. actually had a. It was very popular in Japan too, until they got to a certain point in the uh, the seasons where they just stopped having the continuing storyline that was very different in, the, in America, and they just kind of just did their take on the Japanese version. Then there was no reason for them oh, to have the two versions yeah. in Japan, and then it just went away. But yeah. for a while there, there was like a, a while where the American version of Power Rangers and their 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 stupid juice shop lived in Japan, too. That's interesting. <laughs> um, I've never actually really looked into it, but I'd be really interested to know uh, some of the really early abridgers, um, like who do a bridge series for anime, mm-hmm. um, if the Ghost Stories was kind of like An one of the, of the inspiration for yeah. that. Yeah. that. That's an interesting point. Huh. I never quite yeah. thought of it that way, but it's, it's basically like a professionally licensed abridged totally. series. Yeah. Um, and it's... Yeah, it's about it's about as terrible as it ought to be. <laughs> so, cool. uh, if, if you're in the mood for something just like really dumb to watch uh, when you're hanging out with some friends, uh, give uh, Ghost Stories a try. See if you like it. Um, it's definitely worth um, experiencing at least once. Sometimes first impressions don't tell the whole story. Compassion linger, or is it doomed to burn brightly then fade away? To find the answers, we ask, are you still playing? All right, so we're trying a new segment. We're calling it, Are You Still Playing? Uh, a lot of times on the podcast, we uh, will share a button mosh or something like that, where we're very excited about the game, and it sounds like it's one that we're going to be playing for quite a while. Um, but then, you know, something gets in the way, or maybe it's not quite as good as we first thought, or, you know... Or maybe we just never had the opportunity to talk about it again. Yeah, possibly. Right. Uh, and so we're going to be sort of challenging each other on these games that we sounded really excited about, or that um, we, we said sounded promising to see if we are still playing them, and if so, uh, why, and if not, why not? We're going to start calling each other out. <laughs> we're going to hold... We're going to hold each other accountable to playing video games. This is serious, guys. Wow. Serious. Wow. Okay. Doc... 
Yeah. I'm holding you accountable right now. You should. This is going to be in the back of your mind every time that you yes. sit down to play something. Anytime you do <laughs> a blood <laughs> mosh. So, so, Doc, Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Oh. We talked about it last week. Well, a couple weeks ago. Yeah, you Are know, you still playing? Um, well, I think so. You think so? Um, <laughs> I, I think I beat it, actually, but I'm not entirely sure. Really? Yeah. Huh. Um, it's kind of funny. The villain in the game... Um, his name's Steric, and you're going in there to basically take London back from Steric, who does evil things, evil Victorian things, like child labor. Well, he's British. Right. I mean, clearly Well, he's... you're British, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, so... Um, I, I, I don't know how that works out. It would, you know, <laughs> everyone's imperialistic. It's great. Um, so, <laughs> but, but the thing is, you finish the mainline quest, and then it's like... Um, and, and now Queen Victoria has has things that she wants you to do. And you do a couple things for Queen Victoria, and then there's a cut scene. Because, um, you know, there's a brother and sister assassin. You can switch between them. That's kind of one of the things that's cool about it. Um, and, and she says um, to Queen Victoria, um, do you think maybe you could stop with that whole imperialism thing? Because it's against the Assassin's Creed code, which is basically do whatever you want. I don't know. Whatever. But um, And then... Says that to the Queen. Yeah, she says that to the queen and, and survives it. Um, but she's been working as a spy for the queen. So the so queen just like, it no. Laughs it off. But, <laughs> okay. but then, yeah. Uh, I think not. <laughs> but then her brother looks to her um, and, and says, um, you know, I don't think she's going to be giving you cookies anymore. Because that's what, that's what Queen Victoria was known for, was giving cookies to assassins. Right, um, I remember that, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. so basically, um, at that point, a slide pops up and it's like, uh, your adventure is not over. Uh, you you can free London, which I'd already done. You can do side quests, which I'd already done. And you can build your character, which I'd already done. And then it goes down. And I'm like, okay, cool. Where's the next mission? And there wasn't one. Yeah, so it was anticlimactic. Ending. It was so deeply it felt like anticlimactic. You, you just had nothing else to do. So yeah. you, you just turned it off, essentially? Well, essentially, I have, yeah. Um, mm. I mean... You're um, basically done with it. Yeah. Well, um, no, it, and, and I think, uh, you know, I don't think anybody's going to be seeing me for a while because of Horizon. So... Um, <laughs> We'll, we'll check back with you on that one, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris. Yes. I'm going to call you out, too. Super Mario Run. Right. I recall you talking about that, being pretty excited. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I... It's a mobile game, too, mm-hmm. to be fair. Yeah, I, I was I was trying to justify the $10 price point when you buy the full game. And mm-hmm. I think... I, I still don't regret that. But the thing is, I, I did mention that I think it has more replayability than a lot of the Mario games um, really? that I've played. Really? Really? Hmm. This is personal taste. Yeah. And in fact, I did play this a lot more and a lot more repeatedly than I did play other Mario games. Hmm. Um, but I kind of got to a point where while there's still stuff I can go back and do, um, I was kind of just like using as a as just a time killer. Is it something to like do during a car ride or something like that where I'd go and I'd do the... Uh, the, the versus toad runs, um, and I tried to get more coins, but I had already unlocked all the characters I cared to unlock, and um, I haven't been particularly interested in going back and completing, like, you know, getting all three types of special coins across all the stages. And so while there's still content I could go back and play, it's just not been interesting. And I think the other thing that stopped me playing it, for the most part, while I'll still boot it up occasionally, is uh, Fire Emblem. Once Fire Emblem came out, that kind of, kind of became my go-to mobile game. And so, um, so you just, it just kind of got replaced, got yeah. supplanted. And you know, now okay. that and now that I'm That's thinking fair. back about it, you know, I think that you know the the decision to charge a one time fee for Super Mario Run was a smart choice on Nintendo's part because there's not really much reason. I, I couldn't see much of a way they'd build in um, freemium sort of like ongoing pay us to keep going um, because I think people would lose interest very quickly in that. What about different colored Toadstool hats? For your toad. Uh, no, there's only, there's only no. yeah. Once, once you have, like, toad and toad out, you're just done. Yeah. Actually, toadette, I don't think, has any special abilities. I think it's just the prestige of having toadette. <laughs> the prestige. <laughs> the prestigious character of toadette. Yeah. Yes. Uh, although, when you when you play as toadette, uh, then the judge for the toad rally becomes just a normal toad. Uh, because she's not there, yeah. she's participating. Oh, sure. so, that makes sense. That's kind of fun. Yeah, a little clever thing there. Now, is, is she cool, or is it just toad that's the fun guy? Uh... Okay. (laughs) (laughs) And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion.
So we'll be talking today about, uh, like I said, um, the indie game industry a little bit and kind of what it is that you do, Eric, as a community manager. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess that's probably as good a place as any to start. What is it that you do? Sure. Uh, what's actually interesting about this is um, I actually haven't been doing as much community management in the past few months. Mm-hmm. Um, we... Uh, have uh, I kind of have two main roles that I do within the company. Um, actually, that's kind of just a goal that we had when we first founded was um, I think that it's really important, f- and I always tell like any students that I ever um, talk to who are interested in like entering the industry, like um, looking for advice, is whatever it is that your main skill is, um, obviously specialize in that and do that as well as you can. But if you can, find a secondary role that you can have as well, like um, that you'd be interested in, because then that makes you different from, you know, every other 3D artist that comes through. That makes right. you different, obviously, from every other producer that who comes through or something like that. Um, and so, um, yeah, my background is actually in marketing and, commu- and uh, social media marketing. Um, and then, but my main job is as a producer, as a project management for, manager for the team. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, uh, we've actually been since... Well, I can't say times right now, but um, since last year, uh, we've been actually working with a publisher. Um, we actually did sign on with somebody, um, wow. and uh, thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. That's the that's the big news that um, I'll are you be able, able to, to talk- reveal the publisher. Um, or not at this time. Not at this time. Not at this time. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Next time that I'm on, absolutely, I will. I finally cool. got the date of when that's going to be. And Excellent. It's, yeah, it's very exciting. Um, so um, so yeah, and so because we're working with them. My goals as a community manager and um, like with my skill as um, as like a digital marketer have changed pretty drastically mm-hmm. um, because of course like and what I imagine a lot of this talk is going to be about is like what you can do as an indie studio with like a zero dollar budget mm-hmm. how you can still market your game um, and that that was kind of my goal through mm-hmm. like most of this time and that's all changed now oh. you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I haven't had to do that as much but there is still of course I am still running our handle um, and that's that was really important to me that I still got to keep like our Twitter handle and stuff mm-hmm. like that um, because no matter what happens over the next few years with you know success or not success mm-hmm. or um, how large we get or not um, I, I want to make sure that we never lose the indie feel right. um, I want to make sure it's you know something that we've always had um, like the, and I, I just put it up there just because I wanted to make sure that people knew that. Um, I always have my personal handle mm-hmm. in the Twitter bio for the Polynite Games. Mm-hmm. And the reason I do that is not so that I can get extra followers or anything. It's <laughs> it's because I want people to know that we're not pretending to be a bigger company. Mm-hmm. I think that's always one of the biggest flaws that an indie studio can have or pitfalls that an indie studio can fall into is starting to try to fall into PR speak when mm-hmm. you're just a bunch of dudes in a bedroom, you know? <laughs> right. Um, and uh, so I've always made sure that people know it's me talking to you and mm-hmm. I, I want to maintain that no matter what. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. So ironically, um, while the importance of that has kind of waned in the reach that I can reach on my own, um, because we, we could have you know big advertising and like big marketing campaigns and stuff like that, um, I still stick to a lot of the same tenants, um, even though I'm not like doing it as much now. Um, as we start to get closer to launch and stuff, um, mm-hmm. I will absolutely start again. And I still do a lot like with... Um, I'm sure a lot of the things that we'll talk about, like on Twitter, like with Indie Dev Hour and like with the Game Dev subreddit and stuff, and um, obviously with our Kickstarter backers, still try to do a lot with them. So, mm-hmm. um, so that's really kind of so to actually answer your question now that that's been the <laughs> long lead up to it. Um, as a community manager specifically, what I do is um, I uh, run all of our social media profiles. So um, we're pretty much on Facebook and Twitter. Really, in reality, Twitter. I think that we technically have an Instagram as well, um, but uh, I really kind of focus on. On Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, and the big reason for that is um, that's where our particular audience is now. Um, there's a wonderful indie dev community that is on social media. Mm-hmm. And I personally enjoy using Twitter as a marketing professional and I enjoy using Twitter personally. So it just kind of works. Um, and uh, so I kind of take part with the community that's there. Um, and then also, obviously, then I come up with, we've, we've kind of fallen off of the wagon recently, but um, keep up with, I do like a lot of content um, management as well. And so like we do when we were doing bloggings, I would come up with essentially what our blog posts should be and when they should be posted and uh, do all the editing for that and help each one of the guys um, with writing it and mm-hmm. like kind of make a good uh, good blog. Um, and then we do like monthly dev streams that we do like with our backers as well, um, mm-hmm. where we'll actually have like a Google hangout where like our backers can come in and, um, 
essentially talk about what we've been working on and then uh, stream it on YouTube Live and stuff like that. So it's a lot of just kind of that, um, you know, if uh, I've always kind of liked the idea of like maybe trying to do a podcast or something. We're actually at that point right now. Oh, like cool. Now what else are we going to do um, for what fits what we're trying to do? And that always changes. So it's um, our community is small, obviously, and it's a really odd mix of fans who haven't played our game yet and then <laughs> other indie devs who are excited about what we're doing. Um, and then, of course, that'll all change. And that's part of what's fun and interesting about community management is um, you really change depending on what your goals are as a company um, and those goals will change over time mm -hmm. from what it was a year ago to what it is now to I'm sure what it will be a year from now. So Very cool. So what would you say is like, at what point did you see a big growth in your community. So, like, you know, <clears throat> I imagine there was probably a bit of time, and I, I'm sure the Kickstarter helped a lot with getting kind of like a a, a ground, or what's what I'm looking for? Like, like a like, groundswell. Yeah, yeah. like so you had like your starting point that was that. But Legitimized like, us in a lot of ways. Right. You know? um, but once that happened, like about like how big was your following and then kind of like when, if you, if you ever did see a spike, kind of mm -hmm. when did that happen and how? Um, I don't know if there's ever really been a true spike. Um, I think that, like, I mean, if we go back to the Kickstarter, which was um, 2014 now, mm -hmm. a long time ago. <laughs> um, the Dark Ages. Yeah, yeah. Um, we um, saw spikes, like, depending on where maybe we got an article written and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So that was a really easy way to see it because... Um, Kickstarter has some analytics built into it. Um, but as far as our actual social media, like, awareness, um, actually, I will say when we actually did have one, um, it would have been any time that we actually got major press coverage. And what was interesting is, like, if there was major press coverage that we didn't initiate. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the way that we got through Greenlight, for example, um, was... Uh, it was actually after the Kickstarter, because we ran Greenlight during the Kickstarter campaign. We didn't get through at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but that was at the end of the year of 2014. So at the start of the next year, um, our original release schedule was to try to launch at the end of 2015. Um, so we were put on the map by a lot of... Uh, um, outlets. Mm -hmm. And probably the big one was Eurogamer did um, their uh, most anticipated games of the year. Rock, Paper, Shotgun did one as well that we were on. Oh, cool. um, but what was cool about ours particularly, because like Rock, Paper, Shotgun had broken theirs down by like PC and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, so we were with a lot of other indies, is that Eurogamer one was included with like Back, Batman Arkham City right. and like just major huge AAA titles mm -hmm. and then there's Interspace and they put it in alphabetical order so I don't remember who we were between mm -hmm. um, but it was people who we never would have imagined that we'd be between <laughs> right. and that caused the spike that then got us actually through Greenlight because there was just such an um, quick interest and so um, ironically probably maybe not the answer that you're looking for mm -hmm. but like if there's ever been a spike that we've had in like our following mm -hmm. it was entirely unintended and out of, outside of our um, <laughs> it wasn't planned it, at and all that, that actually does raise an interesting point that I kind mm -hmm. of imagine that um, a, a lot of your following is just based on the whims of the internet you know like yeah. I, I, you know sometimes like even us trying to promote our own stuff you know sure. we um, we don't have a particular strategy in mind, so it's not like we're trying too hard at it. But um, you know, we uh, don't see much growth, and we figure that like it's going to just take that one time of getting mentioned by someone yeah. that's going to make us appear to a bunch of people for the first time. You know, it's like you can sort of there's so many people out on social media trying to promote their yeah. own stuff that's kind of just like shouting into the wind and hoping that someone listens, you know? Yeah, and I think that, I think, that I, I, my philosophy regarding that, and something, because I actually do freelance marketing, um, uh, like consultation, and sometimes mm -hmm. do some management for people as well still, um, is I will always tell people, you never know when that viral thing is going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's either yeah. It's either because you purposefully you're a studio that comes up with viral content so you know one of these things is going to hit mm -hmm. or it just happens accidentally because the right influencer happened to right. do it and their fan base saw it at the right time but what i always tell people is because you never know when that's going to happen it's really hard to manufacture that make sure that you're prepared for when it does happen right that makes sense because you want to make sure that when somebody does come across your twitter feed mm -hmm. um They've seen that you've been active. They've seen your other stuff that you've been doing. Um, so even if you only have like a few hundred followers, they also see that you're super active within whatever community maybe they're also a part of. And then they'll hit that follow button gotcha. or then they'll add you to the list that they pay attention to, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's been one thing that we've been able to do is because I've never really let the handle fall by the wayside. Um, 
whenever we have ever gotten any spikes or somebody mentions, mentions us on a follow Friday or something, um, because I try to be as active as I can on that, um, somebody's more willing to follow and then pay attention. And then the weird thing that happens on social media is, and kind of the unfair thing that happens on social media as well is the larger your following gets, the more exponential that becomes. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I've seen so much more success since I haven't ever given up on that grind of trying to increase our followers. Um, so much more success on our posts after we hit 3,000 than when we hit at 2,000 followers, mm-hmm. and definitely more than I ever saw when we were at 500 followers, sure. you know? Yeah. Um, and so, and of course, there's always ways that you can try to manufacture that through, like, using different apps and follow and follows and following your ratio. But really, the only way that you ever actually do that is just by making, like, just the hard work of mm-hmm. tracking who your followers are and trying to engage with the right hashtags and mm-hmm. the right communities. But, mm-hmm. Gotcha. I mean, when you did get um, in Eurogamer, mm-hmm. and, and in particular, but any of these other sites, is it common for them to contact you first and say, like, hey, we're going to add you to this list of the top games? And you would so and think. So. Or, is it, or is it just they never even tell, do they no. never even tell you? It's just you just opened up the website one day and saw yourself on a list? Um, you have to make sure to set up Google Alerts. Okay. Um, huh. Because either you'll get the email um, that from Google Alerts that mm-hmm. somebody's talking about you, or um, very often I find out from somebody else before that email is even sent. <laughs> um, so somebody like else will say, will yeah, like a fan or a friend. Wow. Um, like that's how I found out about the um, about Greenlight was mm-hmm. um, because somebody sent me um, a tweet that said, congrats on getting through Greenlight. <laughs> and I hadn't even received an email from Steam yet. <laughs> um, and then, of course, it's nice. like, why did this happen? And this happened like kind of over the winter break because after the Kickstarter, we all just unwinded it over the, like that Christmas. Mm -hmm. Um, It took our finals that semester. Um, (laughs) And uh, then I I looked at my tweet mentions and saw people had told me that we were on Eurogamer. Um, And I know I've actually done that for a few friends myself um, when I've seen them on an article somewhere before Mm -hmm. they even heard about it. So, no, they they actually don't typically contact you. (laughs) Um, Sometimes you will get, like them mention you in a post if they repost it later. So, Mm -hmm. like, I found out um, Den of Geek did um, include us in one of their articles for Games of 2017 Mm -hmm. um, just a few days ago, and um, we didn't get any type of notification from them other than the fact that this was published two days ago, and then they did a tweet today saying Space is on this list. And so, of course, then when you go back to the other tweet, when they tweeted out that first post, there was nothing for us. But So we kind of got notified that way. And that's the only reason that I even got notified about mm-hmm. it. So, um, so sometimes if you go through the more traditional route of, like, when we did the Kickstarter, um, sending out, like, a press release or something like that, and especially if you send out, like, a personal email directly to somebody to say, hey, here's a thing that I'm doing, and then also with a follow-up of, like, I'd love to do a follow-up interview or something, then I'll occasionally get a, one of those writers to write back. Um, so, no, typically they'll just simply write it, and then I always try to make sure then I go back and then thank the writer for doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, but mm-hmm. typically, unless there's an interview that's needed or they need a quote from you, no, they'll just do mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And um, that's something I was actually kind of curious about. Generally speaking, how is the reaction to you know you soliciting press co- coverage like that? Like, mm. do, do people tend to react positively to? I mean, I imagine a lot of times it's just kind of they'll ignore you or something yeah. like that. But have you ever gotten any like negative reaction, like oh, don't ask me to do this sort of thing? No. Um, typically, they'll just ignore. Um, I think that it's one of those things that they recognize that they obviously want people to write to them because then that gives them the coverage. Mm -hmm. Um, And especially if you do it intelligently, you try to target the people who you know will cover. They're just flooded with indie devs, I'm sure, every single day writing them stuff, much less their actual, like, AAA contacts that they have. So Mm -hmm. um, that that waking up with an inbox of 100 emails, I have to imagine, is standard fare for them. (laughs) Do you ever get approached by um, some sites, whether large or small, that are sort of soliciting you, like, hey, we'll, we'll feature an article about you, but, you know, you have to pay us a certain amount, or is there anything that anything like that that you've experienced going on, or is that not really something that happens? Definitely not paid. No, definitely, definitely not. not. Um, 
I I don't know. I guess I'd imagine that maybe that happens out there. Um, I'm sure that that's probably something that Gamergate would claim definitely happens. Um, but well, I, I, I actually one of my friends is a is a um, also has an indie studio, and it actually yeah. happened to them. Really, like multiple sites actually. Interesting. From yeah. large sites, or were these particularly like small ones? Uh, I can name a couple specific names if you'd like me to. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so then um, that's that's very interesting. But I think I think yeah. it was because they were in a different. I think it was because they were in a different state where they were with their because they had already had a game come out, and mm, so I sure. think it, maybe it was they thought that they were bigger oh, than okay. they were is my guess. Yeah, which then kind of makes me think that some sites do it for companies that they think are not not really indie companies, like just like a little bit bigger game companies, right? Because you can't really expect you know an indie company to have the money to do that. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good point. That it's possible mm. that that's what's going on. I'm not necessarily even saying there's anything necessarily shady there. That's really just coverage. I know, it is but just straight just, up coverage. Yeah. But, I mean, it's, it is something that I was just curious if you had experienced that because I've I've had them tell me before, like, hey, this happened to us. Mm. This is weird. And obviously they're not going for something like that because they are a small company. Yeah. I mean, they don't have the, the money to do that. As um, we get closer to launch, yeah. um, I'm sure that I could probably um, – Give you another opinion on that, and, yeah. to, and see it, see if that and does it happen. Might, and that could be that it could, could be change, it too, where yeah. it could be you're getting ready to launch, and they're like, "Hey, these people might need that extra push in yeah. terms of the hype." What um, I will say is, I, I have gotten um, solicited for articles in the past, mm-hmm. but it was never, definitely never paid. It was just um, we'd be interested in covering you, or um, uh, or like one that I have a good relationship with um, somebody who works for them as well as just simply the fact that they're one of my favorite um, mm. sites um, where they've told me that we're on their calendar for the year so they can try to hit like major beats in our production cycle and oh, do cool. like an article here and there which obviously happens with AAAs with like the really so, bigs but to, for it to happen with an indie is a little, little less common. Um, so I've had that and then of course then you get... Um, YouTubers and streamers right. who constantly email um, yeah. on, um, can we get a key and we'll make sure to cover it right. and things like right. that. So, um, so, so let me ask you, um, just just because this is, of course, very common in the in the indie game space, and I know you've experienced with this with your project with Interspace as well. Um, do you ever get any sort of backlash from the fan, your fan community mm-hmm. when it's like? Uh, you don't hit a date that you say like we're going to release the game on this date, and you're of course you're just trying to do some ballpark estimate initially. It's really hard to estimate, especially when you have a small team that you can't just you know throw extra money and resources at. If you're if you're struggling in crunch time, you can't do that. Right. So and you might you have other jobs and other other things going on. Sometimes you have to push those dates. Do you experience like a backlash from fans, like any sort of anger, or is it more has it been more of a positive experience? It's almost been entirely positive. Um, and, and I and, and I think follow up to that would be how do you handle that? Yeah, too? yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so on one hand, that is why I am so excited <laughs> that I'm going to finally be able to start talking about it. It's because <laughs> I have known why we've had delays. And I have known mm. um, what, our, what our release is going to be for a very long time. And internally, we've known that. And it's a lot of really cool stuff and very good reasons for why we've um, delayed yet mm-hmm. once again, because we wanted to again at the end of last year. Um, and uh, and it's not just because, oh, hey, we want to make more content and it's in the typical indie mm-hmm. or just new developer issue of scope. Um, it, it's it's so much more than that. Mm-hmm. And not being able to tell people that I think has been more of an issue like personally than it actually has been actually receiving any backlash. Mm-hmm. Um, I think one part of it is um, we don't really have a big fan base. Um, our fan base is our backers um, and maybe some people who have seen us at um, show floors like when we went to PAX or um, Screw Attack or something like that. Um, but then other than that, then a lot of like our followers in our community are either other indie devs or um, content creators, stream, like local streamers and podcasters and stuff like that. And of course, they just want. We just want to have a good relationship together, anyway, so that we can do stuff like this. <laughs> um, and then it just simply helps both sides. Um, and so I don't think that they'd ever do anything to say uh, anything other than something positive. Um, the only time that we've ever really received anything, um, I've made at some of those delays. I've made like Kickstarter posts about it, mm-hmm. and um, essentially partially an apology and then partially um, a little bit of an explanation without the full explanation, of course, because mm-hmm. that's still to come. Um, and 
almost uni- like universally, everything has been positive from the backers. And of course, those are the people particularly that I care the most about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not sure. necessarily not upsetting, but like that I want them to know what we're doing. Right. And I want you to yeah. know that we care mm-hmm. that you backed us. Mm-hmm. I don't care what else happens in the future. We would not be here right now if not for you doing that, that back then. Yeah. You know? um, and, and it's from an entirely genuine place. And I feel that part of the reason... Um, oh, and, and just all that we got were, take your time, mm-hmm. you know, the, the wonderful Miyamoto quote that I always I have printed and, like, just put up on my wall, which is that, um, you know, a, a bad game is bad forever. A delayed game could be, you know, a good game. I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm botching the quote, but... Um, I think I've heard that one. Though. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. And, and people saying that to me and people saying, I just can't wait to play it, take mm-hmm. your time. And I think a part of that is just because... Um, as long as you're honest with people, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. they'll typically be accepting of it. Um, but I think along with that, um, I try to be genuine. Mm-hmm. Um, exactly like what I said at the beginning of this in that like, there's a reason I put my name on the handle. Um, mm-hmm. And there's a reason why it's very important to me that we always maintain that feeling of indie, um, at least for as long as we are, right? Which I, I think should be forever. I don't think that we ever want to grow that, that large. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can't stand a studio that is indie or even that kind of new premium indie of like the new middle tier mm-hmm. that tries to talk like they're one of the AAAs. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Because, because that's such a, like, the community manager for Naughty Dog, I have to imagine, wishes that they could just simply interact with people the way that like a small studio does. Mm-hmm. Um, but they can't because there's so much red tape and there's HR and there's a whole PR team in between them yeah. to which all they can do is just put out, here's the latest mm-hmm. DLC and yeah, like stuff the, like the that. The lines run through the lawyer. Exactly. Yeah. Right. The yeah. one notable um, exception, right. I think, to that is uh, the Sonic the Hedgehog Twitter. Yes, <laughs> I completely agree. But they've still kind of found a workaround right. for it, right? In that, like... They aren't really like. There's a lot of odd things social media marketing wise that we can talk about with them, but like they <laughs> they aren't really even talking their product right. with the fans, and they're also not really engaging with fans. They're creating this persona for people to engage yeah, with, right? You yeah. know, no, that it is very a very different approach. Yeah, um, yeah. So, um, but anyway, uh, no, I, I just I I'm curious because I, I did want to ask just. I know that you have you have your own personal account and then yeah. you have the the, the Polynet account. Um, when you're when you're tweeting with the Polynet account, do you what what sort of different approach are you taking from like your personal you know how much how much of your personal life I guess you could say do you also filter through the Polynet account if mm. if any. Um, Almost none. Almost none. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, just because it is still representative, while I'm the person who does the tweeting for everything, mm-hmm. it is still representative of, you know, six to ten people. Um, sure, and yeah. so um, not only do I want to paint anybody else in a different light than what they are or put any words in anybody else's mouth, um, I also want the focus of that handle to be on the products that we create, right, not necessarily yeah. Yeah. on opinions of it. And that's one of my minor frustrations. I follow a lot of, um, and it's I, it's granted it's the personal accounts, but I follow a lot of, say, um, independent RPG developers yeah. because I really like their stuff. And very occasionally they'll talk about their RPGs, but most of the time it's just personal stuff. And so like, I get just a little bit like... It, I, I could unfollow them. But I don't want to unfollow them in the event that like they come out with something I actually do want to see. <laughs> um, and so it, it's just one of those things where I understand though it's a personal account. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and mm-hmm. I kind of wish that they would more frequently have handles that were separate so I could just get their games, right. for example. Yeah, it's an interesting mix, especially when you work with somebody like that. And then when you have the indies that uh, – just skyrocket into popularity suddenly Mm -hmm. where it, it worked better when they were a personal handle and now where are they? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I hate what happened to them because I can't use them as an example because there's so much baggage. But like, just look at like Sean Murray for example. Yeah. Like, you know, that was the first one that popped. Yeah, in. I mean, because that was his personal handle, yeah. um, and uh, I think it still is. And so it, it's really very odd um, when you get into that situation. I'm sure that like Stardew Valley is probably in a similar, similar situation, um, you know. But of course, a much more positive connotation, <laughs> right? Um, and so uh, yeah, I, I've actually and I've gone through phases myself with with that oh. handle in that. You know, there's different ways to grow your audience, and there's different ways to engage with audiences. And so, um, 
as of late, really pretty much all that I've used the Polynight handle for is just doing work in progress updates. Mm -hmm. Or like if there's an update that I have to make to go out to our fans, like when we're going to do a live stream and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. But for a long time, when I was trying to get us more followers... I would do the. Um, I would have us also post like just articles that we find interesting that obviously have to do with game design. Mm-hmm. But if somebody was coming to our handle to learn about inner space, mm-hmm. they're also going to get a Gama Sutra article tweet and mm-hmm. stuff like that, you know. And so it's it's a really odd um, a balancing act to try mm-hmm. to play of you want to try to grow, and so you want to do a lot of those things that are required of that. But then at the same time, that's not really necessarily genuine of, like, here is my product. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, it's the unfair part of social um, in that the broader your audience is, the less that you have to do the things that you have to do when you're smaller, you know? (laughs) The irony. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. So the people who have more influence now don't do the things that, like, you try to do when you're smaller to try to get influence. Right. Right. It's the same when you go to the bank looking for a loan, you know? Yeah. (laughs) If you need one, they're not going to give it to you. Right. (laughs) You've got tons of money? Sure, we'll loan you money. Yeah. Like, I don't need it. So so as as a a community manager, and when you first started, um... Did you sit with the whole Polynite team and kind of try to figure out, you know, what is what is the company philosophy? What what are our goal, like general goals in terms of just mm-hmm. mindset? Or is that something that never really came up? It's kind of something that never really like came up organically. Or? Yeah, it's. Um, I think that it's partially. It, it's something that I think I fought for a long time mm-hmm. as like kind of our marketing guy that. I want us to get branding, and I want to make sure that we stick with these particular colors, and I want us right. to. Um, actually get a logo because at some point that's going to matter um and we never really had those conversations but what did happen organically um were like and and i think a part of it as well is i just simply know um the type of games that we are and therefore the audience that we're going to have and kind of direct the tone in that direction. You know, we're we're not making a game that Devolver would pick up or we're not making a right. you know, tiny build game. And so, like, we're not going to do the really super goofy um, tone mm-hmm. that way. But at, the same, and, but at the same time, obviously my personality is going to come through at some point. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that for a long time I was having an issue because I didn't want any personality to come through. And then I ended up doing that we're a small studio. I'm doing this in you know my bedroom, um, and I'm acting as if I have a legal team and a PR team that's coming <laughs> through us, and they're making sure that. And so I always use the pronoun "we" and stuff like that. And <laughs> that was actually something that I I make sure to tell other people now to not do is I never use the "we" pronoun really? anymore. Really, really no, interesting. I always say "I," unless it is something like "we're oh. going to be here." Right. Um, unless or, you're specifically addressing the whole team. Yes, like, exactly. Otherwise, I say something like like if. Um, I see somebody uh, on like a screenshot Saturday, and I see something that I really like. Um, I'll simply say, "I love this," or "This is up my alley." Mm-hmm. Um, me, Eric, not necessarily. This is because up, you've like, attached your name to that. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And cool. so, because of that, obviously, if like Steve or if like Tyler were running the handle, their interests would be very different from mine. If mm-hmm. I run across somebody who is testing out a new uh, like narrative scripting system, mm-hmm. I'm going to be super interested in that because that's where. That's what I do in the game, mm-hmm. and so um, I'm going to do that. You know, when it comes to comments like like that, not just the post, but the actual comments, um, do you try to avoid commenting on non game related subjects? Like, say, say I, I don't know if you're also a sports fan. Let's say yeah, you're sure. a big, yeah. or, or yeah. you're yeah. we're in a right. Yankees, the Yankees right now. Yeah. Like, would you comment as the um, the Poly Knight Twitter handle yeah. something related to like someone posts something about the Yankees, would you comment like, "Oh yeah, go Yankees," or is this is that kind of verboten for? That no, that would account? be entirely for personal account. Um, and I think a part of that is just because you're going to um, alienate people who don't like the Yankees. Well, <laughs> there's <laughs> always that. Well, but, but, but it's not game related. It's kind of right because I mean, you could alienate hypothetically someone like if you were to comment say on a game and say, "Oh, I love this game," yeah, or "I hate this game." Well, because everyone has their own opinion. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But let's say you hate a game that someone else loves, or vice versa. Mm. You know, that you could potentially, you know, are you really going to alienate someone? I mean, maybe. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. But it, but it is game-related. It's relevant. Well, we're in a really relevant time for that right now, right? Sure. Um, I mean, over the past month, we've seen um, studios take stances on things that are happening politically in our climate that they either agree or disagree with. Yeah, and, um, you know, some of them, like your Insomniacs, who, have, who, of course, had their video, are very large and... 
aren't really going to be affected by that. Um, but then you've seen um, uh, some small studios, uh, you know, obviously, like, I mean, he's he's an indie, but he can hardly call, like, Rami from Flambeer Small. Right. Um, but, of course, make the stances that he's made. Um, and uh, the Freedom Bundle that was on Humble for the past few weeks, like, that was, like, really spearheaded by him, I believe. And all the people who are attached to them, you see the people who run Finji, who recently published... Um, uh, night in the woods mm-hmm. um, they're very vocal about about it but I actually don't know if they do anything from their personal handles you know yeah um, and so I think that there are studios who do um, and I don't think that there's necessarily anything wrong with that mm-hmm. um, I think that you know you're entirely within your right to especially in a small company where you have more of a voice to let the company's voice represent you if you mm-hmm. want it to be mm-hmm. um, I think that for me um, on one hand, um, representing multiple people, I don't really want to place that on them. Mm-hmm. And while I might have opinions on something one way or another, I want people to come to the studio for game-related stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'll absolutely do things. Like, I'll retweet um, a Twitter friend who I know is going on Game Light uh, or Green Light, yeah. or um, I'll comment on stuff like that through the Twitter handle. Um, but non-game-related, no. I do try to avoid that. Not necessarily because I think... I'm scared of the repercussions, but just really kind of more because it's not really representative of what this experience of interacting with Polynite is supposed to be. Right. It's off the focus. Like you might, people could see it and there's almost, it's almost defeats the purpose of them following that account, potentially. Yeah. You know, right. they, might, they might want to know about game related stuff. They click the follow to hear about, I want to know about Polynite games and what they think about games and all yeah. this stuff. And they see something that's not related regardless of what they think about it. It's like, wait a minute, why is Polynite? commenting on you know who knows who yeah knows? we don't who need cares? to take a stance it doesn't on it. yeah matter. it's exactly it's it's the idea that um and that's where we are like it's the cool thing about digital media now and um doc going way back to our classes together in yeah. which we talk about like mm. how th- bloggers vloggers podcasters anybody out there you can make a really big following almost the more um kind of specialized you become because what ends up happening is um, people go to you for whatever that specific topic is. Mm -hmm. And so like, I know I have certain people that like when I want to learn more about like this particular RPG, or if I want to know more about this take on uh, this move that a uh, you know baseball team made. I'm going to go to this writer, or I'm going to go to this podcaster, and I want to hear what they have to say. God knows if I want to know what's happening in um, like a, Boston sports, I'm going to go to Bill Simmons, you know? <laughs> yeah, right, um, right. And so it's that idea of I, I could show that, like, th- yeah, obviously we all have opinions and we all have a lot of things game-related even that we want to talk about. Um, there is something very specific that Polly Knight does. And what we do is we are part of the Dallas game dev community. We're part of the Dallas indie community, especially. And we're part of the Twitter internet, like indie community. And that's what you come to us for. And while obviously that's more than just simply posting what our personal, because that's that's like the baseline, right? Yeah. Is if yeah. I didn't want any opinion to be shown, I would only show what we're working on and that would be it. Yeah. But no, we're part of a community. I want people to know that. So that's about where I expand is... Um, I want to show, because we do kind of weird artsy games, Mm -hmm. and so I want to help other weird artsy games and show these weird artsy games to people and when they do really weird stuff. But I do draw the line there. Um, So, like, if I come across, like, a really weird work of art or something, Mm -hmm. while I might share that from my personal handle, I'm not sharing that from Polly Knight because it's not Mm game-related. So Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's the community that, and I think that a part of it is that it's because it's, the message that I'm trying to push and kind of the tone that I'm trying to take, but then also it's the audience that I feel like I've cultivated is that that's what they're also... Well, that's all what they're like, expecting from that. That's what they're expecting account. from us and everybody who's part of like this followership, mm-hmm. we all obviously have about like seven dozen other interests, but we all come under Poly Knight under this one interest. And so I think it's only fair that we just keep that that way. So, um, so just... I know you you know everyone on the team on a personal level, mm-hmm. but uh, just kind of has have you ever run into a situation? I'm not asking you to name names no, of course, or anything. Yeah. Where someone on the team, because um, everyone has their own personal accounts too, yeah. where you felt that someone on the team had like you had to go talk to them and say, "Hey, 
don't um, talk about this subject or don't use this sort of language or don't mm-hmm. you like something that you felt might reflect poorly on Poly Knight's games itself, like say say someone on the team, you know, uses a lot like drops a lot of F bombs in their tweet hypothetically, and you're like, as a company, we don't want to be seen as the company that has people that drop F bombs hypothetically. Is that something that's ever come up? You mean it... that discussion we had with you? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well I'm just I'm just dropping them all the time. <laughs> and we all agreed that, that you needed to be dropping more of them. That was our, our oh, maybe was just that catch the up. Yeah. Oh, right. I wasn't really <laughs> listening. Or, or or has that not been an issue? I think luckily it hasn't really been an issue. Um, I do think that... I'm trying to think if it actually has come up. I feel like it maybe has. Um, And that's part of the reason that... You know, you see anybody who works for a studio, especially like one that has like a real HR department and stuff right. like that, they'll often put, you know, tweets are my own opinion and stuff, or opinions are mine, you know, or, or opinions are not of the studio that I work for. Um, and I don't know, probably it might be smart to have everybody do that. Um, mm-hmm. But there's always the chance that happens, right? Yeah. Um, right. And then how does that reflect on everybody else? Um, I guess that partially, luckily, we haven't come across that, and so that's almost like a bridge that you cross when you have to. Um, I think that what I have brought up is to remind people that the weird thing about social is you never, whenever you get that um, realization or that reminder that you're not just throwing stuff out into the void when somebody does send something back and, and they're in disagreement with you or they remind you, here's something you said before or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, and it's that, it's that weird element of then, of course, then the bigger that you get or if you're attached to a brand, um, that you remember what I say is not just me anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm talking right. for others. Um, and I think that for me, I, you know, I'll never run across that because I double, triple, and quadruple think something before I tweet it out or before I say something. Um, but I have brought that up with everybody else that to keep that in mind, mm-hmm. um, that there is a company behind you that you do need to make sure to not go and get sideways with somebody else. Um, I think that what I think that where it has come up is if people were to complain about something in the game mm-hmm. um, and. Uh, Oh, kind of like airing the dirty laundry of the game of of the behind the scenes stuff. Uh, no, or no, just like when, um, like when we were getting coverage during the Kickstarter or uh-huh. something like that. Um, kind of your typical rules that a PR team would tell like everybody on the team, which is don't engage in fights mm-hmm. and things like that. And it's and it's not even really just because you could bring us bad press. It's more just because nothing good is going to come right. from that. There's going to be people right. who don't like your game. Bears. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so, like, the typical rule that I think it was it was Tim Ferriss or somebody out there has said is that, like, the typical rule is let somebody say something, respond back. Obviously, don't do it with vitriol. Do it with right. um, as much kindness as you can. And if they still come back with anger, <laughs> just end the conversation there. Because obviously nothing like positive is going to come or constructive is going to come from that. It's either just a troll or it is somebody who genuinely has an issue. But if they do genuinely have an issue, they're probably not going to continue to respond with anger in the way that, you know, they did with that first post as long as you come back with sugar, you Mm -hmm. know? Um, So, so partially, luckily we haven't run across it, but I think a part of it as well is the constant reminder of, Mm -hmm. you know, just um, be the person that everybody wants to be. And you're typically okay. Um, well, we're getting close to the uh, the end of our show, but I did want to kind of ask, you know, is there is there something just Poly Knight related news that you'd like to share? Um, I know you kind of mm. insinuated the the news a little the, bit earlier. The, the next time on, perhaps, right? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, stuff's just still coming along. Mm. Um, it's uh, um, we're in a pretty awesome place. Um, we know about how much time we still have to go, and. It's a little scary to look at what still has to be done, but what's really cool is, um, you know, we've we've I've handed out already that obviously it's a broader scope than what we originally imagined. Um, the eventual game that ships when um, when we hit gold is going to be over double the size of oh, wow. what we had originally wow. ever intended. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's very cool. And and there was a moment that that hit us like back in might have even been December um, that. Uh, we realized we'd already made more content than what the original game was supposed to be. Like, we'd hit that point. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And so that's, that's been pretty positive for us internally. Um, as far as anything else that I can talk about, um, I think that what we've shown actually um, for like cons, one of the things that we actually wanted to do, um, which is something that I would will definitely do in the future, one of the things that you really learn as you go through your first game is um, how important mixing your um, production cycle with your marketing cycle is mm-hmm. and actually coming up with like major... Um, production milestones around kind of important marketing beats. Mm -hmm. And of course, a large part of that is not necessarily knowing what those marketing beats are. And um, so knowing that like Mm -hmm. there's the initial announcement and you want a trailer around that time. And then if you like when you hit beta and then like when you start to actually ramp up for for launch, um, that there's there's major like press outlets will care about you at those times. Mm -hmm. Um, And then what we've really uh, the lesson that we've really learned over the past few months that we've been working on is having a solid Solid build that, like, really try to build as early as you can that is representative of what the entire game is, not only to simply show at, like, cons and things like that, but then also for when press does want to see the game or for when, say, you're selling the game to um, a publisher and somebody wants to actually be able to play it. Um, Having something really polished, it's not just a proof of concept, Mm -hmm. um, and isn't even really necessarily a vertical slice, but is a demo. Mm -hmm. And what's really nice about having that demo is then when you get surprised by a con or when you decide that you want to go to one, no matter where you are in development, you know you have something to show that's stable, that's going to interest people in the game. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that was kind of the last big milestone that we've hit that... um, uh, I can definitely talk about because we've we've streamed it and it's up there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, we essentially built a whole world around just our tutorial. Um, and mm-hmm. so, it's it's going to be the game's tutorial. It's the start of the game, um, but it is an entire world that's just introducing people to it. And of course, and that works when you take it to cons because now, for the first time, like we did um, a holiday party a few weeks ago for the local IGDA chapter, nice. and it was the first time that. Um, we didn't have to handhold when people played the game. Oh, nice. And that was really nice. We actually got to just simply hang out with people as they were at the booth and then let people play the game on their own. Mm. Um, and so then that's really what we've been up to. So we have a really nice polished tutorial. We And, and this far into the game, this far into development, it seems silly, but a really polished understanding of what works in the game and what doesn't work in the game, mm-hmm. um, what mechanics should be expanded upon, and luckily we were right about a few of them, and mm. what doesn't work too well. Mm -hmm. And so either what needs to be fixed at the later levels that we have already built or Mm -hmm. um, what just simply needs to be taken out and then and then fix that way. And so that's kind of where we are now is wrapping up kind of the last parts of the games that still need to be built and now doing a lot of um, kind of just game loop and gameplay and quality of life feedback. Cool. Um, So so that's where we are right now. Excellent. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. So can't wait to hear what is coming next. Yeah. We need to have you back yeah. for a part two. I'd love to be back for a part two. Well, consider yourself invited. Cool. <laughs> and thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode number 94 of the Backward-Compelled.com podcasts. Uh, Eric's insights on uh, indie community management and marketing. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. I'm Eric. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.